from the great emperor krishna devaraya who came from kannada lineage wrote in telugu in honor of a tamil poetess devotee andad and celebrated the unique oneness of this culture vanakkam ellaru nalla irkingla solunga nalla irkingla நான் தமிழ் கத்துட்டு இருக்கேன் தெரியுமா என் சகோதரர் அண்ணாமலை அவருக்கு இங்க தமிழ்நாட்டில் அரசு அமைக்கு அரசு அமைக்கு நான் உதவி செய்யணும் அதுக்காக தமிழ் கத்துட்டு same mother kaveri and today the bjp thinker cell under the leadership of my very dear brother the resurgent hope of tamil nadu shri annamalai ji has given me this opportunity to come before all of you and speak about a very interesting subject the common cultural linkages between ganga and kaveri i come from the land which is the ugama sthala of kaveri and naturally as a bhartiya we have imbibed in us the spirit of all holiness which pervades this great land if one were to understand the very essence of bharat as a nation one will very clearly understand that bharat is a nation not because of political jurisdictions but primarily because of the cultural space and the cultural unity that has kept this country as one in her uh, seminal book india a sacred geography diana ek makes this very interesting and poignant point she writes and i quote india is united by its sacred core not by the power of kings and governments but by the footsteps of the pilgrims 
India is a sacred geography. This line that India is united by the footsteps of the pilgrim is something that has kept this country as a culturally thriving entity, a naturally aligned entity from the past millennia. The concept of Tirthyatras, our festivals, our gods, our itihasas, our epics, our stories, our holy rivers, our temples, our music, our culture, our dances, this is what has kept India as one, Bharat as one, despite kings coming and going, invasions that lasted for centuries, despite earthquakes, floods, pandemics, despite droughts and famines which were deliberately engineered, governments came and went, kings came and went, elections came and went, Chief Ministers, Prime Ministers came and went, but Bharat remained as one because Sanatana Dharma protected this land and kept this land as one. Which is why when Sri Aurobindo was asked to define nationalism in the Indian context in his very famous Uttarapara speech, Sri Aurobindo defined nationalism as Sanatana Dharma and Sanatana Dharma as nationalism in the Indian context. Because again we go back to where we started because India is not a piece of land. India is not a piece of real estate. India is a sacred geography. Which our Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji said Kand Kand Me Shankar. This was how he described the sacred geography. And this sacred geography houses thousands of stories. As the president of the Yuva Morcha from the last two years, my party has given me the opportunity of traveling the length and breadth of this country. And I must share before all of you that in the last two years I have completed traveling near about 2 lakh kilometers of travel all across the country. Multiple times to different parts of the country, different states, union territories. Wherever I go, our karekartas and the people of the state welcome us by narrating and quoting an anecdote or a story or an incident from the Ramayana or the Mahabharata. If I go to Gujarat, the Dwarka, the Karakarta say, Adhyakji, we are from Dwarka, the land of Sri Krishna. When I go to Manipur, our Karakarta say, this is the land of Rukmini. When I come to Mahabalipuram, our Karakarta say, whatever the DMK may say, but come to Mahabalipuram and see the Pancharathas, it is named after the heroes of the Mahabharata. Never in this country's cultural history have we heard of incidents where a pilgrim or a saint had to approach a government official to obtain a passport to go from Tamil Nadu to Kerala or from here to Kashi. And this extends to thousands of years. Which is why Adi Shankara, born in the southernmost part of this country, walks all the way up to Kashi. And there in the hinterland, the heartland of north of India, he composes the Kala Bhairava Ashtakam in respect of a god who primarily is respected and primarily celebrated in the southern part of India. No king ever asked Adi Shankara a passport for entry. It was believed in this nation 
that whenever in whichever part of the country any great scholar produces a work of scholarship a copy of that work should be preserved and kept for posterity in the sharada peetha in kashmir so when the sharada peetha in kashmir was ransacked manuscripts from all over the country in different lipis were found and they were destroyed by those who wanted the end of the civilization but it also shows how not just transport but also the cultural affinity was so one and united throughout the country even before a few centuries when you could find easy transport easily important works of scholarship from the southernmost tips of india to the northernmost part of this country i was in gujarat during the elections of 15 days ago my dear friends i happened to visit in one uh, village called kankrej you may have heard of this uh, cow breed called kankrej it is a very popular breed so i had i happened to visit this district called kankrej which is almost on the border of uh, pakistan there was a very old temple where uh, avadhuta was sitting and uh, the the tradition is that from lo- from almost uh, 700 800 years the peetha tradition continues when i went and visited and took the blessings and darshan of the avadhuta there he told me how every year from kankrej and those districts of gujarat thousands of pilgrims go to make a teertha yatra to hingala mata in baluchistan of pakistan and still keep the civilizational memory alive this is how this country this country's culture and civilization is kept intact friends whether it was shankaracharya's establishment of the four mats at the four corners of the country or the temples that our ancestors established in honor of different gods in different parts of the country i just met our karyakarta from tanjau and i asked him your city is famous for the surya narayana kovil there are four very important sun temples in india one sun temple is in martanda which is right now in the part occupied kashmir the second is in the west in modhera in gujarat the third you have in konark in odisha in the east and then you have in the south in avron tanjavur the surya narayana kovil in the south whether whether it was the prayers to the navagraha deities whether it was the mats whether it was the festivals all of these kept this country as one throbbing cultural entity friends even the temple architecture is something where you find great commonality between the north the west the east and the south of this country very recently i came across this very interesting snippet in kashi one of the most important deities of this of the town is annapurna and here in kanchi in the kanchi kamakshi temple just opposite the garbagraha you find a special sanidhanam that is made for annapurna a very interesting fact is that in this special sanidhanam for annapurna devi in kanchi you will find that the temple vimana has six peaks which is very unlike other south indian vimana gopuras and if you try to find out why this vimana has six peaks the answer to that is 
the annapurna temple in kashi has six peaks and that is the commonality that you will see the narada sutra the narada samhita is one of the oldest texts which describes in threadbare detail the architecture the rules and regulations on construction as well as the temple sculpture if you were to ask a dmk fellow he will tell you this narada was also north indian the narada smriti is also north indian <laughs> but you go to any temple in the south of india 99% i am saying 99 because the recent temples i do not know but all the historical temples 100% are according to the rules and shastras and the regulations as laid down in the narada smriti as and the agama shastras this is how the temples have been done here. this is how through festivals through temples through art music and culture this country was culturally kept as one i don't know if uh, uh, in tamil nadu this practice is there but in karnataka in kannad in, in when we were all growing up when we were you know in uh, uh, first standard second standard just when um, cursive writing and handwriting were to be taught in school our uh, grandmother my grandfather they would all make us sit and do one exercise every day morning we were supposed to write in the you know a4 size sheet paper in the notebooks that they would give that one single line uh, notebook shri rama jay rama jay jay rama this was what we were supposed to write one or two eight times a day to improve handwriting i don't know if this was a common exercise that we did it here but this was something when you know growing up from that culture when i hear somebody say that rama is a north indian person <laughs> you will be astounded and shocked and also you will be flabbergasted at the person making the claim and his stupidity you have a one of india's top cricketers his name is lakshman shiva ramakrishnan <laughs> and the people here say rama and krishna and lakshman are north indians for how long have we let this kind of a narrative gain ground here friends if we understand how festivals played a role i mean it is common knowledge it is so obvious you know all these things that i am telling all of you none of this is something that is something that i have cooked up it's only when you have to lie that you have to cook up something to establish and propound truth all you need to put is your own lived experience before people so i do not want to elaborate how whether uh, you know uh, pongal in uh, tamil nadu suggi in uh, karnataka sankranti in gujarat maharashtra bihu in assam how this has kept the country together there is also very interesting you know why this is an agricultural festival and because we were we all come from this agricultural background as a country even large hindu festivals like kumbh mela finds resonance in different parts of the country we generally know that there are uh, the four important kumbh mela that happen one in prayagraj where it is the sangam of ganga yamuna and saraswati in nasik in ujjain and then in haridwar and kumbh mela is a very it's you know if you try to understand kumbh mela you will understand how the sanatana dharma system functions no pamphlet is printed no banner is made out no announcements are made through loud speakers people assemble on the said day from different parts of the country in all religious fervor 
they come they take a dip they offer prayers to whatever parampara they follow and go back silently a miracle that you can witness only in this land the interesting part is why all of these four primarily happen in the northern northern and the central part of india in the south in our own kumbha konam we have our own version of the kumbha mela and it happened it's it's a maha maha mano mang and maha magam and all of and the beauty is araka when she was uh, uh, introducing the theme for today was quoting from gange chaimune chaiba so the legend says that the kalyani that is in kumbhakona in front of the shiva temple the entrance of the shiva temple has shiva with nine goddesses and all these goddesses are the nine rivers in all parts of the country and when the yatra takes place and all the devotees and the gods from all across the town come and do the holy dip it is believed that you get more punya by doing the snanam here than what you get in all the nine different rivers combined so this is gange ch yamune chaiva godavari saraswati narmade sindhu kaveri jaleswin sannidhi kuru in action you may not know the shloka by heart you may not have memorized the shloka but even if you are the quote unquote the unwashed illiterate the village pilgrim you are living this theory living this sutra living this mantra in action this is how our culture designed the oneness of nature oneness of living friends uh, i am in chennai today and the madhuri season is going on i would uh, it would be unjust if i do, do not make some reference of how music and dance has also kept us together if you understand our classical arts it may be whichever part of the country when i went to assam and i was listening to the sankirtana that was happening in assam shankar deva and uh, the other uh, folk singers if you try to understand very keenly the lyrics you will find surprising similarity to the folk songs the sankirtanas that are say in the tamil language or for in my case i found great resonance to the vachana sahitya that basavanna and other great thinkers of karnataka had been where is karnataka where is vachana sahitya where is shankar dev and where is assam but all of this the classical music of this country the devotional music of this country binds us again together i was told that muttu swami dikshitar one of the greatest composers in the carnatic music lineage lived for a long time in kashi and it was in kashi that he was influenced by the music forms in kashi in the northern part of the country and that is where he was inspired to compose the gange mam pahi kriti and it is also believed that it was in the hanuman ghat of varanasi that devi saraswati gave him the divine veena and blessed him whole heartedly to continue the seva for the music it again is a matter of shock that fake narratives have always tried to create artificial fault lines and divisions between all of us it was said that hindi is north indian it was said that 
Vishnu or Rama is a North Indian god. Yesterday, Sai Deepak and I were on the same flight, and we, I was, you know, discussing this. The uh, Kriti by Swati Tirunai. Vishweshwara Tano, Vishweshwara Darshana Kar Tano Mano Chalo Mano Tum Kashi. I'm sure many of you have heard this. This one Kriti demolishes most of these fake narratives. It is composed by Swati Tirunai, a king in the southernmost part of India in Kerala, composed in Hindi to in reverence and honor of a god Vishweshwara residing in Kashi in the northernmost part of the country. And he himself has the pen name Padmanabhadasa. So this fake narrative of Vaishnava versus Shaiva, Hindi versus Tamil, North versus South, all of these are demolished if you are rooted and understand what really is the culture of the soul. <laughs> so is Bharatanatya, which is inspired. Bharata Maharshi's treatise. And if you read up where Bharata Maharshi, Bharata Muni lived, he lived the greatest part of his life in Ayodhya. So I, I am surprised as to how for such a long time we allowed narratives of this kind to run aground. When I travel Maharashtra, I especially the youngsters here, I make a very sincere request to you. If you want to really appreciate first hand the impact of the Tamil Bhakti movement all across the country. Make a visit to Maharashtra. There you will realize how the Bhakti movement which emanated and originated in the southernmost part of this country here in Tamil Nadu swept the whole of the nation and was also the most potent and resistant force in the north against the Islamic invasions that swept through the country. <laughs> one of the greatest contribution, one of the greatest contribution by the Tamil civilization in recent times is this resistance that the Tamil nation provided, the Tamil civilization gave, inspired the rest of the country through the Bhakti movement. This is the lived reality. This is how all of us have understood Indian culture to mean to live because this is the only life we have lived. Anything else we do not understand because this is the reality that we have lived in what in Upanishadi terms can be called as Anubhava Pramana. What is the Pramana for testing the truth? Experience. That is the truth. That is the basis of experience. That is the touchstone of verification of truth, experience. But unfortunately, what we experience as a lived reality and what we were told in the classrooms in history or the political narratives that we were forced to buy was something very different. Friends, I want to just highlight Again, this was, this was something that uh, Sai and I were discussing yesterday of how the complete U-turn that the British missionaries did with treatment of the Sanskrit language is a great indication of understanding their nefarious design behind this. If you observe, in the early part of the 18th century, the British missionaries Starting from Monia Williams to Max Muller, all of them made very serious and a very sincere attempt to understand, learn and master the Sanskrit language. And there are multiple evidences that are available 
as to what was the motivation behind them learning the Sanskrit language. They even established chairs and scholarships to enable people to study Sanskrit language. And all of those scholarships at the time of the endowment, at the time of selecting the candidates, they make it absolutely clear that the motivation again was to learn Sanskrit so that they could use it as a tool to convert the natives. So the motive behind learning the Sanskrit language even by those people who are today hailed as savants of the Sanskrit language was also to convert the natives. Then you will see at a later stage, say after a century later, the end of the 18th century, when Sanskrit was dying a natural death thanks to the systematic and deliberate killing of the Gurukula system and when people started realizing there is not going to be social mobility learning that language, economic mobility learning that language. Then came heroes like Robert Cadwell, who again used the Sanskrit language, but there was an absolute U-turn. What was to be a tool to, to, use, to convert the uh, natives, now the same language was called demonized as a tool that a certain sections of the country's upper classes use to, to subjugate the masses. This was a new narrative that was crafted. If one were to make a very simplistic study of this U-turn in the treatment of the Sanskrit language in just a matter of 150-200 years, one will understand the nefarious design that was behind the treatment or rather the study of the language itself. So the racial theory was born, language was used, linguistic divisions, linguistic diversity rather was used to prevent the larger consolidation of the Hindus. And which is why fault lines or divisions or diversity that existed naturally in the Indian culture was used by those who hated this culture to create perpetual divisions. Friends, I just want to highlight two, three important issues before we think of some actionables that we all can take. The period between 1915 to 1925, if you look at the country's political history, the period between 1915 to 1925 marks a very important as well as a very interesting period for India's political history. It was in 1917 that the Justice Party was founded. It was in 1920 that the Communist Party of India was founded. And it was in 1925 that the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh was founded. So this period between 1915 and 1925 is a very interesting period. It was only 25-30 years before that in 1885 that Evo Hume had uh, founded the Congress. So if you broadly look at these four organizations, you will realize that with the exception of the RSS, all the other four organizations, all the other three organizations were either founded by a foreigner, in the case of the Congress, or was inspired by a foreign ideology, in the case of the Justice Party as well as the case of the Communist Party. And you will also realize that in the case of the Communist Party, it was also founded in Tashkent in USSR. It was not even found in India. So the only Vichardhara, the only organization that was founded by Bharatiyas, representing the Bharatiya Vichardhara was in 1925, that was the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Organizations 
दे आर नीदर भारतीय इन स्पिरिट नॉर आर दे इन थॉट एंड नेवर हैव बीन इन एक्शन टूडे वी आर इन नाइन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू द थ्रेश होल्ड ऑफ सेलिब्रेटिंग अ सेंचुरी ऑफ द एग्जिस्टेंस ऑफ दीज थ्री विचारधारा इन दिस नेशन अ वेरी ब्रीफ एंड अ वेरी कर्सरी एनालिसिस ऑफ हाउ दीज थ्री आइडियोलॉजीज हैव वर्क ऑन दिस नेशन विल एनेबल अस टू मेक very important choices for the coming next 25 years which is a very crucial period for the countries and the civilizations future the party that was founded by a foreigner in 1885 and which was also led by a foreigner for more than a decade <laughs> the less said the better about its contribution and the havoc that it created in this case the decade that it ruled was a decade of dk for this country <laughs> most of the ills that inflict the country's polity today the country's culture today the country's administration today all of these allies the the malaises that afflict the country the gangotri for all of this is 10 janpat <laughs> the the second ideology that was founded in 1920 the communist party of india in 1920 in tashkent like its uh, like the congress party even that is on its way to extinction the only last remain remnants are today perhaps in two places in some parts of uh, in kerala and in some these stalls in jam in uh, jail other than that you will not find you will not find this ideology relevant or alive anywhere but if you look at this ideology all throughout the country all throughout the world you will find that this ideology this vicharadhara has this innate ability to morph itself into new avatars so it keeps taking new forms it wears different masks and different colors so as long as the society is aware and wary of the possibility of this ideology taking multiple forms and this perpetual metamorphosis that goes on with this ideology we can be rest assured that the country will be safe the society will be safe from those new forces which are now trying to create havoc in delhi and try to enter gujarat also and fail miserably i was in uh, kerala just 3 4 days ago i had been there to salute to participate in a shraddhanjali program organized by the bharatiya janata yuva morcha in honor of our former vice president of the state shri jayakrishnan master shri jayakrishnan master was murdered by the communists in 1999 december 1 he was 36 years old he was teaching a class full of students and in front of his students the communist terrorist butchered him and killed him by in the most horrible most horrific of manner his body was cut into eight pieces in front of his children in front of his students for more than a decade most of the children who witnessed this murder had to go through therapy this is broadly the contribution of the communists to india violence violence in the name of protecting freedom of expression 
violence in the name of protecting diversity violence in the name of protecting and championing the cause of the poor friends i also met our karyakartas who were there in jail on false fabricated charges a karyakarta was 27 years old he is convicted he is not an under trial he is convicted on an attempt to murder charge on a and when i asked him how many years has he completed he said he has completed 2 years asked him how many more he said 12 more years the lower judiciary is completely politicized there is no avenues available to seek justice this is the kind of ecosystem that the communists have created in their last bastion this has been the lasting legacy and we all know that the justice party which was started in 1970 <coughs> has also metamorphosed today into the dmk which to borrow professor vaidya's words is a family run unlisted business enterprise <laughs> prosperity in this country and that is our vicharadhara the vicharadhara that the bharatiya janata party represents <laughs> nothing can be a better example for this than comparing the seven terms that the bjp got to serve in gujarat and the seven terms the bjp in the communists got to rule in west bengal the seven terms of the bjp's service in gujarat has made gujarat one of the most prosperous states of the country the per capita income of gujaratis is one of the highest in the country gujarat is the state known for its best kept law and order there is shanti there is samruddhi there is suraksha <laughs> compare the same with the seven term communist rule in west bengal which has impoverished the state reduced most of the population to penury and poverty perpetually kept class wars at play and reduced what was once the civilizational torch bearer of this country the bengal land to one of the most uh, uh, diminished one of the most deracinated places and population today in the country this is what the communists did in seven terms that they were blessed with the reason why i had to mention all of this my dear friends is this that the political narrative the political narrative is an all pervasive narrative the narrative that we set in politics determines what kind of narrative is set in your music the political narrative determines the kind of movies that are shown the political narrative determines the kind of sportsmen that are encouraged from art to sports to culture to the kind of books that are published the political narrative is omnipresent omniscient and determines everything fix the political problem rest of the problems will all get solved on its own <laughs> friends looking at the way the country is voting out these ideologies repeatedly and embracing the ideology of inclusivity of bharatiyata which celebrates diversity and never uses diversity as fault lines to peddle political agenda 
whether it is in Gujarat, whether it is in Uttar Pradesh, whether it is in the Northeast, we will realize that the time has come and the time is right for Tamil Nadu also to be walking on this path. Friends, politics is a very interesting business. The message is important. But in politics, the messenger is also as important as the message. For a very long time, not just people in Tamil Nadu, people even outside of Tamil Nadu who are sympathetic to the interests of this nation, of this culture, of this civilization, of this land, we always felt that we needed a stronger messenger to put our message across in Tamil Nadu. And today, the message that was always strong, the message that inherently has strength, the message that is as old as this nation itself, has found in Annamalai a strong messenger. And, and let me tell you, let me tell you with 100% certainty, a very, very silent, but a very, very real revolution is taking place in Tamil Nadu as we speak. This change is being noticed, acknowledged in different parts of the country. When I am in the northeast of India, say in Gohati, boarding a flight, a very sympathetic to the Bharatiya cause youngster talks to me and asks, why Tamil Nadu may is bar hot change hoga na? I say lag raha hai. This is this is the overall sentiment throughout the country. It is now our responsibility to translate this intangible sentiment into tangible political dividend. <laughs> Friends, I want to only say this before I conclude. From the time of the Vishnu Purana, from the time of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, from the time of the Vedas, from the time of the Shiva, Rama and Krishna, this nation has always been one. Whoever may try whatsoever they want to, but it is impossible to break the unity that is integral to this nation so long as the country's people remain true to its dharma. Because that is the secret of this country's soil. Dharma has united this nation. And nothing is more important for Bharat today than unity. Unity at the, lang at the level of our languages, Unity at the language of our states, unity at the language of our myriad different traditions and culture, and unity in every aspect. We must remember that the Bharti Janta Party and the RSS combined have done more to lift the people out of poverty than the communists have done ever in the whole world. In the last eight years, this country under the leadership of our Prime Minister has lifted the largest number of poor people out of poverty than in India's existence as an independent nation. So those people who, whose career, whose politics, 
has completely been built around poverty they can take a break now <laughs> those people whose politics have based have been based on ideas random ideas like rationality can be rest assured that the country has made more progress in the last 8 years in science and technology under modi under the bjp than any rational thinking government more number of scs sts have gotten empowered in the truest sense under our government than those people who made political fortunes in the name of those people if there is one party which has garnered the support of the highest number of mps from the sc st community it is today the bharatiya janata party because they today know that it is bjp which delivers real progress and empowerment in this sense my dear friends we are the ones who have brought this country together we have the we are the ones who have brought this country united and i feel in the coming 25 years the south of india is going to contribute immensely for the country's prosperity the country's unity and what bigger what better an example to draw inspiration from the great emperor krishna devaraya who came from kannada lineage wrote in telugu in honor of a tamil poetess devotee andal and celebrated the unique oneness of this culture this is what we are this is what we will be and it is on this foundation that bharat will be established as the jagat guru of the world thank you so much for hearing me out today namaste